when I'm analyzing my data, one of the things I frequently will run into is that I'll have different pieces of information stored in different files as separate data frames. My challenge, though, is how do I read those in, clean them up, and join them together? Well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about in today's episode of Code Club. Hey folks, in recent episodes, we've been looking at a variety of ways that we can visualize a single variable across different categories. So we've been looking at, say, a, diverse, a diversity measure like inverse Simpson diversity index across three different disease groups, uh, people with and without diarrhea, people with and without a clostridioides difficile infection. Uh, and so I'd like to take a step back from the pretty images and cool graphs and animations and whatnot and think about, you know, how do we get the data into R? How do we clean it up? And how do we join it together? These are all functions that we can do within the dplyr package from the tidyverse. Now, five, six years ago, before I kind of saw the light and came to the tidyverse, I would do this all in base R using kind of the built-in functionality in R. And it worked, but it was pretty messy and it was pretty error prone, I found. One of the things I really like about dplyr is that it makes things really safe and gives me a lot of confidence that things are working the way they should, not like I thought they were and often weren't uh, when I was kind of rolling my own functions with um, base R. So we're going to go ahead and dig into that in today's episode of Code Club. Um, I'm starting here with a pretty minimal script. You can get this script if you want um, from a link down below in um, the description. Uh, there's a blog post that, again, will have uh, these five lines of code. If you can't type it yourself, that's cool. Um, if you want the files that I'm working with and to see how I set things up, again, there's a video that I'll link to across the top. And if you find the, the content that I'm presenting here uh, interesting and exciting and you want to learn more and kind of dig deeper into it, also um, down below in the description is a link to my materials that I call Minimal R, which is the basis for a three-day R workshop that I teach that really digs into this type of content in a lot more detail. All right, so let's get going. Here again, we are reading in the tidyverse and we're reading in read Excel. Read Excel is installed with the tidyverse, uh, but we need to load that into our, our set of libraries. And that will allow us to read an Excel spreadsheet in as metadata. Read underscore TSV will allow us to get a shared file and a taxonomy file. So let's read these in. So if we look at metadata, again, this is a data frame. And one of the easy ways that we can look at the data frame is by typing the name of the variable at the prompt. Another thing that we can do is say view metadata. And that will open up a um, interface that looks a lot like a spreadsheet, but you can't you can click on it, but you can't edit it. It's, it's read only and you can sort the columns and whatever in this view mode in this tab that's created uh, in the upper left panel. And so in this mode, at least, you can sc scroll across, see all the different columns. There's a lot of information here. This is a file that we uploaded with the data when we submitted the data to the a sequence read archive. This is called a MimMarks file. And so you'll see things like our primers and PCR conditions and all sorts of different things. Um, the data were originally generated from 454. And then you'll start seeing things like the people's age, race, gender, whether they'd taken antibiotics, proton pumps, so forth. Right? There's a lot of other metadata in here, uh, clinical data about the patient, the, the, the metric we're interested in is this disease stat column. And again, you can kind of scroll down and see all the entries. Uh, so both the view and typing the name of the data frame at the prompt will help you to get a, a sense of what the data look like. So the metadata has the data, the, the data about the data, the clinical data on each of these uh, patients. We can also look at OTU counts. Uh, this is a data frame that has counts of different OTUs, operational taxonomic units. Uh, if you're new to this field, think of these as bacterial taxa. If you want, if you have to, think of these as bacterial species. They're not really, but that's not the topic of this conversation. Um, this label is how the OTUs were defined. The group column is the subject ID that corresponds back to this sample ID from our metadata. And then we have the number of OTUs. These are the number of columns that follow the data frame. Uh, and then we have the names of the OTUs going across the columns. The values in each of these cells then, this 365, says that OTU2 showed up 365 times in this patient, uh, whoever the third patient is in the study, okay? So we see now that we've got a table with counts of taxa by person, by subject. We also have the metadata for each of those subjects. The third person piece of information that we don't have is an identity for those OTUs. And if you're looking ahead, you might say, well, maybe that's in the taxonomy file, Pat, right? And sure enough, if we look at the taxonomy file, we see a column for the OTU. 
we see the size, which is the number of sequences in the study that were in that OTU, and then the taxonomy, a string indicating the taxonomy for that OTU. So we have these three data frames that we would like to join together. And perhaps you're noticing like, you know, I could use the sample ID and the group name and join those two data frames together, but those column names are different. So I'm not quite sure how we might do that. Or you might notice, well, in the shared file, the OTUs are across the columns and in the taxonomy file, they're across the rows. Uh, in addition, you know, the, the column names are weird, right? And they, they just perhaps don't line up. Also, the taxonomy column in my taxonomy file um, isn't formatted in a way where it's really easy to get access to, say, the phylum or the family or the genus or whatever taxonomic level I might want to look at. Finally, you'll notice there's also columns in these um, data frames that I don't need, right? Like I don't need the size. I don't need the total number of sequences for that OTU across all samples. I don't need the PCR adapters. I don't, I don't need all that extra information. And it would be nice to clean things up and remove those pieces of information. Again, that's exactly what we're going to work on in today's episode of Code Club. I'm going to start with my metadata data frame. And again, to remind ourselves, um, this gives us a data frame that has a sample ID and also a disease stat column. I, I really only need those two columns for the analyses that I, I foresee myself doing. So to get the sample ID and disease stat column, I can use the select function. So I'll pipe the output from read Excel, which is currently this data frame metadata into a select function where I will then say sample ID, sample underscore ID, comma, disease underscore stat, run that. And now I can look at metadata and I can then see that I've got the sample ID and disease stat for everybody in this study. One of the other things I might want to do with metadata is then to do metadata and then pipe that to account on disease uh, stat to see what the distribution looks like. So the output of this shows me that I have um, an NA value. Uh, so that's NA um, 14. So there's 14 rows in this data frame that have an NA. Again, I could do metadata um, and f pipe that to filter and then say disease stat equals equals uh, quote NA. Um, one of the things I notice is that NA is not red. In this case, it's black here in our studio and it's in a column of type character. So I could then disease stat equals equals uh, NA the string. I don't really want NA stored as, as a string. I want it stored as an NA. And so we'll come back and see how we can fix that. And sure enough, what I'm seeing here is that uh, these NAs are actually correspond to MOX and uh, GD, which is what we call a generous donor sample. So I want to go ahead and get rid of those. Um, to do that, though, I need to go ahead in my read Excel statement and do NA equals quote capital NA. And so if I run that and then I repeat my, um, my count, I now see that my NA here is red. And so that's in good shape. And now what I can do is I can do drop underscore NA and put in uh, disease stat. So now metadata will lose all of those rows that have an NA value in the disease stat column. So now I'm happy with the way metadata looks and we're ready to move on to our OTU counts. So again, our OTU accounts, you'll recall, um, has different samples in our rows and our different OTUs in the columns. There's two extra columns um, in OTU counts that are at the beginning. One is label and one is num OTUs. And so there's two ways to get rid of those. Um, and so let me show you those quickly. So I can do select and I can do minus label and minus num OTUs. And so whereas up here we used select to get the columns we wanted, if I include a negative sign before the column name, I then drop that. It takes a moment or two to run because the data frame is really wide and R frankly hates really wide data frames. Uh, there's other packages we could use to read it in that'd be a lot faster like the fread package. But for our purposes today, this, this is good enough. We see now that we lost that label and num OTUs column. Another way that we could do this, if I comment that out and I could do select uh, group and then I could do starts with uh, starts underscore with as a function and then OTU with O being capitalized to you being lowercase. And then if I run this, and so I get the same output, right? I get the group and then the OTU columns. This is the same um, output that we got if we used select with the negative sign. I'll leave both of these in here. Um, 
I, I personally prefer to be positive and telling R what I want, not what I don't want, because if the output were to change or the, the input were to change somehow, um, it, it's, I think, safer to be positive, indicating what you want to get out rather than what you don't want to get out, right? One thing that I would like to do, perhaps, is change the column name of my group to be sample ID to match what I had up above in metadata. So I can do rename, and then I can do sample ID equals group. And now when I look at this data frame, I see I have sample ID in that first column. Looking ahead to my taxonomy file, my taxonomy file had those OTU names in rows um, under a OTU column. Um, here I've got my OTUs in columns. So this is not tidy, right? I would prefer to have my sample ID, my OTU number, and then the count um, for each OTU in each sample. So a three column data frame rather than a data frame that as we see here has close to 2,500 columns. Again, R really struggles with wide data frames. And so we can tidy this using the pivot longer function. So I could do minus sample ID, and that will pivot longer all the columns except for sample ID. And the names will go to names two names underscore two equals and I'll say OTU and values two. I'll call count. And so as we can see now, in OTU counts, we have the sample ID, the OTU, and the count. So we can see that OTU3 shows up in DA00006 250 times. And that's now a very long data frame with close to, with over 840,000 rows and three columns. And so R just loves <laughs> working with these tidy data frames. And again, this is the plier, right? We're part of the tidyverse and we're working with data in this tidy format. Now we want to go to our taxonomy data frame, where again, we've got our OTU column, our size column, and our taxonomy column. And I can start to clean this up by doing select, and I will do um, OTU and taxonomy. Again, you could say minus size, whatever works for you. And so we've dropped that. My column names are all uppercase at this point. I really prefer to work in lowercase column names so I don't have to wonder like, was that capitalized or not? If I just know everything is lowercase, then I don't have to think about it. And there's a lot less kind of cognitive burden on me. So I can do rename all. And then the argument to rename all, I can say to lower. And what this will do is this will apply the to lower function to all of my column names. And we see now that I have OTU in taxonomy being lowercase. And so now I can see that I've got sample ID that I can use to join metadata and OTU counts. And I now have the OTU column that I can use to join OTU counts and taxonomy. Before I do those joins though, one last thing that I would like to do is get this taxonomy column into a format that's easier for me to work with. Um, and so I might want like the phylum name here, Bacteroidetes, or I might want the genus name, Bacteroides, right? And so let's go now and see about how we can clean this up a little bit further. Um, because this is going to take a few steps, I'm going to go ahead and remove that taxonomy variable name so that when I run this, it outputs it directly to the screen without me having to write taxonomy over and over again, because that gets kind of tedious. And so here we're going to go and use some functionality from a package called string R. And the first thing I want to do is remove those parentheses with the number inside of that. That number indicates the percent of those sequences in that OTU that had this taxonomy. And for my purposes, I don't really care about that for here. So I'll do mutate on taxonomy. And I'll then say um, str replace all. So I'll remove every instance of what, what I'm going to be looking for and replacing uh, in the taxonomy column. And I will then say the pattern I want to find is something that starts with a open parentheses. And so to match an open parentheses, I need two backslashes. And then I want to match a digit. And so to match a digit, any digit, I need back back D. And if I want to match zero or more, I would use a star. And if I want to match one or more digits, I'd use a plus. So I'm going to go ahead and use the plus. And then as you can see in my pattern, um, I need a closing parentheses. So I'll again do back back parentheses. And so this, this um, argument is a regular expression. And there's so much you could do about regular expressions, but um, we'll save that for another day. But you can hopefully see that this pattern will match any number in a pair of parentheses. Um, and because I'm using that back back D, if it ran into a letter, it's not going to match it because a, a letter is not a digit, right? And so that will work. And then I'm going to replace that actually 
with nothing. And you'll notice I'm not matching the semicolon, and that's because I'm gonna use the semicolon for something here in a moment. So let's go ahead and run this and see if it does remove those numbers in the parentheses. And voila, we got rid of those numbers in the parentheses, and that's, that's very nice. Okay, so the next thing that we're ready to do is to separate our columns into the different taxonomic levels. And I can do that using that semicolon that I left in here. I will pipe this into the separate function and I will separate taxonomy and I will then say into and I'm going to give it a vector of column names that I want. And so again, King Philip came over for good spaghetti as how I remember a kingdom phylum class order family genus species. So we'll do kingdom uh, phylum uh, King Philip came class order family, genus, and we don't have species information, so I'll leave that there. Um, and then we will do uh, sep equals, and then in quotes, I'll put a semicolon. So we'll go ahead and run this. Ah, so we get a warning message. Expected six pieces, additional pieces discarded in 5,445 rows. Hmm, that's like every row <laughs> there is something missing. So let's go ahead and let's look at what is in that taxonomy column for, say, um, o to one. So I'm going to go ahead and add to this filter um, o to u equals equals o to u zero zero one. That's not getting me the full thing, unfortunately. Um, so let me then do pull uh, taxonomy, and that will give me the value that's in that taxonomy column for o to u one. And what I can see is there's a semicolon at the end of my string. And so what's happening, I think, with separate is that it sees that semicolon and it creates an extra column at the end. So I need to go ahead and also remove that final semicolon from all of my strings. So I'll leave that there actually for now to test things and make sure things work. So I'm going to add another uh, string replace function called on taxonomy. So I'll do taxonomy equals str replace. Um, and I'm going to use replaced because I'm only going to make one replacement on taxonomy. And here we're going to use another regular expression, which is um, a dollar sign. And what the dollar sign means is match the previous character occurring at the end of the line. If I used caret b, that would mean match the b at the beginning of the string. But if I use a dollar sign, that means match it at the end of the string. And I, I will again match that with nothing. Um, and I think I need a comma there, not an m. So let's go ahead and run that. And we now see that we lost that semicolon at the end of our string and we're in good shape. So now if I remove that filter line, put the separate back in there and run it, we're good to go. We get all the columns that we expected to get and we are now ready to join everything together. So I'll reassign this to taxonomy. So how do we do all this joining? Well, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> so we've got metadata, we've got uh, OTU counts, and we have taxonomy, right? And so these are the three data frames that we'd like to join together. Well, to join those three data frames, we're going to use a function called inner join. And what inner join does is it will take two data frames and join them together on a column. And you can you give it one column, you can give it two columns, you can give it multiple columns, whatever. Um, and it's only gonna output those rows from the two data frames where the column you're joining on is found, or the, the value for that column is found in both of the data frames. So if I do inner join metadata, and OTU counts. So now I see in this output, I have the sample ID, the disease stat, this is coming from metadata. I have the OTU number, uh, and that's coming from my OTU counts data frame, and then count, which is also coming from the OTU counts data frame. So that's pretty slick. I've joined two data frames together. If I was concerned about what might be missing from one data frame or another, I could do anti-join metadata OTU counts. And this would tell me what's in metadata that's not in OTU counts. Um, and I see that it says tibble zero by two, nothing is missing. Um, I could also then flip the order here to do OTU counts metadata and see that nothing is missing there as well. And again, running that, um, one of the things that I see is that it says joining by sample ID. I prefer to be explicit in telling inner join what I'm joining on. So I could do by equals sample ID, again, to make that explicit. Um, it's pretty smart at figuring these things out for you, but again, I find it safest um, to, to be explicit. So now when I run that, I no longer get that message. Okay, I'm gonna move this anti-join up ahead here. 
Um, and what I need to do now is I need to join in the taxonomy information so that I can add that to my OTU information. And to get that, I can now pipe this to another inner join, right? And so now you're saying, well, I've got taxonomy and I wanna join by OTU. So I'm gonna join by the OTU column, but what am I gonna to join to taxonomy? Well, in the plier, when we are using the pipe that we get from MagRitter, you can use a period comma, and the period will indicate the data flowing through the pipeline to that point. So I can put period taxonomy, again, the information from this first join in the left side of the output a data frame, and then joins to it the taxonomy using the OTU information. And if I were to kind of flip this order, so to taxonomy comma period, then what we'll see is that we get the taxonomy information first and then the metadata second. Um, I tend to put the period first. Um, I don't know why. Um, I think it's, it's easier for me to read that the information from the pipeline is going into that first slot. So we now have this data frame where we have the subject sample ID, their disease status, uh, the OTU for each subject, the count, and then the taxonomy information for each of those taxa. This data frame looks great. One last thing that I would like to add to this, however, is a column for the relative abundance. We have the count, but I'd like to convert that uh, to a fractional number. So how do we do that? Well, again, we can use more functions from dplyr. So I will say group by. Group by allows me to take my data frame, and in this case, I have um, 841,000 rows, and it'll allow me to chunk those rows of the data frame according to some variable that I have represented as a column. So I want to group by my sample ID because I'm gonna to wanna to get the total number of counts for each sample for each subject. And then I'm going to count the total. So I'm gonna get the sum across all the counts and then use that to divide um, as, the, as a denominator um, to get a relative abundance. So we'll group by sample ID and we will then do mutate rel abund and we will then say rel abund equals count divided by uh, sum of count, okay? So it's only gonna do the sum within each subject. And we run that, and we now see we've got this relabund column off, off to the side. One last thing about this data frame is that it's still grouped by sample ID. I find that this grouping uh, tends to cause problems down the road. And just to be safe, I always like to keep things ungrouped as much as possible. So I'll add ungroup uh, to this pipeline and now when I look at the output, I see it's no longer grouped. I will then save this data frame as otu underscore rel abund. I could probably even go ahead and then select um, minus count to get rid of that count column. If I wanna double check that my relative abundances for each subject add up to one, which is always a safe thing to do, I could again do otu rel abund, and then I could do uh, group by and I could group by sample ID, and I could then pipe that to summarize, and I could say total, and I could then do sum rel abund, and then all of the values should add up to one. And so we'll run that, and we see that we get one for everything. One last thing to comment on with this data frame is that for some purposes, it might actually be considered wide because we have all these taxonomic levels as separate columns. It might be preferable to kind of make that uh, tidier still by making a column for say taxonomic level and then taxonomic name. So let's go ahead and do that um, because we never know where we might need to use this. And so what we can do is we can again do pivot longer. So I'll do calls equals, and I'm gonna, because my typing as you all know is horrible, I'm gonna copy these down. Um, and I'm also going to add OTU as another taxonomic level type. And then I will add to that um, names two equals level, and then values uh, two equals taxon, right? And then we need to close in parentheses uh, to close that out. So now we see that we've got a tidy data frame with our sample ID, disease status, relative abundance, the taxonomic level, and the taxonomic name. This will serve us very well as we go into the future and thinking about doing analyses at different taxonomic levels or with different taxonomic groups. And so again, coming into subsequent episodes here, we're gonna look at a bunch of different ways, some good, some not so good, um, ways of visualizing this relative abundance information and, and leading us forward to looking at more types of data 
And instead of looking at a single variable like the diversity measure, looking at me many measures of a community and looking at these different taxonomic groups and their relative abundances. So I hope you stick around with us. Please be sure that you've liked this video and that you've subscribed to the channel so you know when these upcoming videos are released. I'm trying to do two or three episodes a week. Things do get busy, but you know, I, I think this is important. I really have a lot of fun doing it. If you like this type of content and would like to learn more, please be sure that you check out the rifamonis.org website. On there, I have two tutorial series, one called uh, Minimal R, which is this type of material um, directly for microbial ecology. There's also a general R material that's up there um, that, that covers this material, but not with microbial data. Also know that I teach this content in three-day workshops. I have a couple workshops coming up this summer in June and July. Would love to have you participate. And again, you can check that out at rifamonis.org. Anyway, keep practicing. Please tell your friends about Claude Club. It's been great to see the growth of this channel. We'll see you next time for another episode.